morning. At least we are closer to being on time than last Wednesday. We were about two minutes, two minutes late Wednesday. It's like we were all talking and suddenly Sally goes, hey, it's two, two after. <laughs> and so uh, good morning. We are finishing Leviticus today. I've got a little extra thing because I don't think the one chapter is going to take the whole hour. Uh, so we are going to get an idea of what apologetics is all about. You don't know what the word is or means, I'm going to give you an example of what it is. Uh, something that's very current in the news, um, but we got to get through chapter 27 first. Uh, so, uh, by the way, to let you guys know, um, we're going to start Second Chronicles. I don't, I don't know if we're going to start next week, because um, next week is 4th of July week, folks. So I don't know if you want to just, what's the rest? What do you guys say? Keep your shot for day off. Okay. Gives me a, an extra hour to work on my sermon so I don't have to work on it later in the week. So we won't meet next week. Following week on Monday, we will start up with Second Chronicles, except we are going offline. So if you want to participate in the Bible study, you'll have to be in person. Um, that, that way the conversation has a little bit more freedom to it. Uh, plus I don't have to look at the camera every once in a while to see that you're still there. Uh, so, so we will start Second Chronicles. Uh, the reason why is when I was looking back on the things that we were um, deci deciding, I found out that and I told the group here, we had done First Chronicles on Wednesdays before we shut down for COVID. And so we were starting Second Chronicles, which a lot of people just, a lot of commentators and Bible scholars, it's just Chronicles. It's, it's all one book. So, uh, so those of you that haven't looked at First Chronicles, you might want to read through it. <laughs> Before you got two weeks, two weeks to read through it, uh, and this could very chronicles could very well be my last Bible study for a while. It's like right, it's like twenty eight, thirty chapters. <laughs> it could very well be my last Bible study uh, until whenever. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks uh, again as we gather together, as we uh, complete this book and just seeing how it informs our worship today. Uh, again, too many people think that you just throw away the Old Testament and it doesn't have any impact, but uh, no, it still does. Christ has fulfilled that, the Old Testament and, and still those things fall into rhythm in what we do. Uh, maybe not exactly the same way, but also, but in some regards into that sense of God uh, placing his holiness upon us and how, how do we respond in that holiness. So guide us and lead us uh, today as uh, we finish off the last chapter. Uh, again, a very uh, pivotal chapter in how we respond to all that God has done for us. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Chapter 27. Where's Jack? Oh, uh, we have the hot tub repairman at the house. La di da. So it did, it, 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 the, the issue did not get resolved, I guess, the last time. I think when they fixed the last thing, they didn't reconnect gotcha. something correctly because the water was leaking out. Ooh. Ooh. That's not good. And he was the one that was so adamant that we could probably spend a whole hour on this chapter. I can't see it, Jack. So if you're watching at any time, um, you'll just have to inform me later. Uh, so, so we get into this. Even the commentators, those of you with the Lutheran Study Bible, you can see their, their notes there. The commentators find this as sort of a... Um, seems like a last minute addition that that this add on is like okay why was this added on and they they somehow feel that 
it, it was to end the book on an up note. <laughs> because if you saw the way we ended last week, it was all these things that uh, walking contrary and what God will do uh, uh, to, to separate us to, uh, from the covenant. Uh, so this, to me, this would be the add on is how do we live out the covenantal relationship? Because the reality of it is, from whom does the covenant come? Right. Typically, a covenant is a two-way work. Right. It's a two-way work, but, but God's covenant is a one-way work. So it's, it's, and this is where Jack would chime in with the old uh, stewardship campaign from years and years ago, his love, our response. Um, and, and that's really that's really how we live in the covenant, you know, because, again, we go, go back to uh, I am your God and you are my people. And, and that's really the simplistic form of the covenant. And, and so uh, as we look at this chapter, um, this this chapter sort of puts out there the freedom you know, if you if you look at the other things we've talked about, you know, God has prescribed all the worship elements, you know, the sacrifices and and who does what and all this. This this one has sort of that freedom. It's 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 the vow offering. Um, vow offerings were generally offered when there was a circumstance in your life that you were praying that God would correct and bless. Um, and so you gave a vow offering. Uh, part of this also is when um, somebody is dedicated to the church, um, as, as Samuel was by his mother. Uh, there's some involvement in that. Um, and, and so, um, well, we'll read through it. And, and I think I asked you last week, how, how do we... How do we do this today in our church life? How, how, how do we make our response to the covenant? Um, in, 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 because again, in our worship life today. So um, we're just going to read this in chunks all the way through. If somebody would read one through eight. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, If anyone makes a special vow to the Lord involving the valuation of persons, then the valuation of the male from 20 years old to 60 years old is 50 shekels. That means 50 shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If the person is female, the valuation shall be 30 shekels. If the person is 5 years old up to 20, Years old, the evaluation shall, shall be for a male 20 shekels and for a female 10 shekels. If the person from is from a month old to five years old, the valuation shall be for a male five shekels and for a female valuation shall be three shekels of silver. If the person is 60 years old or over, then the valuation of a male shall be 15 shekels and for a female. Ten shekels. If anyone is too poor to pay the valuation, then he shall be made to stand before the priest, and the priest shall value him, and the priest shall value him according to what the vower can afford. Okay. So it sets sets down um, just how how each person is that. What is the basis for their value? Okay, gender and age. What more specifically? What what factor of gender and age would would this reflect? What? I'm fishing my question. I don't know. I don't understand the question. It says here, men of fighting age would pay them up. Or working age. working age. What work can you do? What work can you offer? Um, 
you know, it's how would that fly in today's society? <laughs> Sorry, women. Sorry, older women. You gave me supper tonight. Right. Um, The, the vow would be if, if, as I said before, if there was, let's say you were childless and, and you were hoping to bear children, you would make a vow, a vow offering. Here's the valuation of it. So a woman in her 20s, you get the prescription of what that vow offering would be. Okay. So again, God is still prescribing things. But this isn't, this isn't like the other offerings. The other offerings were mandatory. You did this. For these, it was, you did it if you desired this. Is that what happened in Judges, where the judge <clears throat> defeated the enemies, and then as he was going back to his house, he says, I'm going to dedicate the God there, comes out the door, the dog came out. Yeah. And that, and that then fits into this valuation uh, in, in doing that. Let's move on 9 through 13. If the vow is an animal that may be offered as an offering to the Lord, all of it, all of it that he gives to the Lord is holy. He shall not exchange it or make a substitute for it, good or bad. If he does, in fact, substitute one animal for another, then both it and the substitute shall be holy. And if it is in, is any unclean animal, that may not be. And if it is any unclean animal, that may not be offered as an offering to the Lord, then he shall stand the animal before the priest, and the priest shall value it as either good or bad. As the priest values it, so it shall be. But if he wishes to redeem it, he shall add a fifth to the amount. I like the little. I, I like the little switch in there that <coughs> if if you off, if you offer a substitute, then you lose them both. Right. <laughs> but but again, the the whole idea of the bad were the unclean. You could. And this, this is where this is different from the sacrificial offering. You could not offer an unclean animal in a sacrificial offering. To the vow offering, you could, because uh, what they would, if it was a clean animal, they probably would make it a, a burnt offering. Uh, because if you remember, there were vow offerings in that list way back long ago. Um, so, so if it was a clean animal, it would be offered as a burnt offering. Unclean animals were not. Well, an unclean animal would be sold, and then the proceeds would return back to the the temple the synagogue. Um, so, so as, again, it, it was still and and you know again, once once it is dedicated to the Lord, who who does it belong to? Right, right. It, it is holy. Right. Um, you said you there was something in there that you wanted to question, or yeah, no, I just thought it was interesting. You know, but wishes to know if there is any anyway. The, the, uh, it was about the unclean, and you went in for it. Yeah. Right. Well, and 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 notice <clears throat> these things could be redeemed, could be bought back, but at a price. Yeah, that's right. And and well, and. and, and Right, and, and and what it would be is it would would replace what it would have gained. So again, remember it's the Lord's, so uh, again a fair uh, addition to that, albeit a stiff price, twenty percent. <laughs> Can you imagine if we paid twenty percent tax on everything that we have? Yeah. Next fourteen. Uh, 14 through, ch -ch 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 -ch. we'll take a long section here. 14 through 25. 
If a man dedicates to the Lord part of the land that is his possession, then the valuation shall be in proportion to its seed. A homer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver if he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee. The valuation shall stand. But if he dedicates his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall calculate the price according to the years that remain until the year of Jubilee. And a deduction shall be made from the valuation. And if he who dedicates the field wishes to redeem it, then he shall add a fifth to its valuation price, and it shall remain his. But if he does not wish to redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed any more. But the field, when it is released in the year of Jubilee, shall be a holy gift to the Lord, like a field that has been devoted. The priest shall be in possession of it. If he dedicates to the Lord a field that he has bought, which is not a part of his possession, then the priest shall calculate the amount of the valuation for it up to the year of Jubilee, and the man shall give the valuation on that day as a holy gift to the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, the field shall return to him from whom it was bought, to whom the land belongs as a possession. Every valuation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Uh, 20 geras shall make a shekel. So you could make a vow offering on a piece of property that wasn't yours. But it would be, what would probably be happening is you, you were farming it. And you got, you got, effectively got the lease until the year of people. Correct. And that's why they're, that's why they're present value. Right. So if they would if they would offer that once Jubilee hit, it would go back to the original right. owner uh, on that. Uh, next, if somebody would read twenty six. Can we hold you, up? Go ahead. Got, sorry, I'm really having difficulty. What are they actually doing? You've got a field that sounds like it might be a field that has rain. Right. I, I'm harvesting, I mean, I own an acre of something. What am I dedicating? What am I, what am I dedicating and what am I keeping? I don't know. You're probably dedicating the crops. So in other words, well, I get nothing Pardon? from that acre. I get nothing. You get nothing, from correct. Acre. So my, which hopefully I have five acres and I'm only dedicating one acre. <laughs> okay, I'm getting it now. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> But, but the way our IRS works, it's you got five acres and you're giving them four. <laughs> well, and, and, and again, this, this sort of gives us an idea of what that tithe is because notice the addition is always 20%. You know, we, we start getting into the idea of what a tithe is, you know, a, a certain amount uh, dedicated to the Lord. Um, again, and I don't know where it, it says, and I don't know if it does say 10% somewhere, uh, but that's typically what people think is, to me a tithe is, what is that regular portion that you are dedicating to the Lord? That, and, and we'll get into that. Once we get through all of this, that's my discussion at the end of this, all of this, because Bob, I'm having the same problem with all of this. I've gone through it three times. I feel like I'm 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 looking through a a, a lawyer's contract. Uh, yeah. Don't you feel that way reading oh, this? Weird. I mean, I feel like I'm reading a lawyer's contract, trying to make sense of all of this. Um, uh, and, and and I just I just you know cut to the chase. Give me the bare bones. <laughs> Give me the bottom line. Uh, uh, and that's where we're going to get to. We're going to get to the bottom line. But it kind of in response to what Bob said, apparently what they're doing is they're coming with this issue that they need to make a vow. And so the gift from for the vow is that field. And right. the temple gets the harvest off the field. So I guess part of my problem, Gene, also is I'm just left my brain go over. The 
it's almost like, like some of the what we hear today of the prosperity people. Uh, yes, you're right. There are some churches that operate this way. And, I, and I'll, I'll get to that when we get through to the end because there was one congregation in Lakeland uh, that did that. Um, and they imploded. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, where are we? Uh, tw 26, if somebody would read 26 to 29. But the, first, oh, go ahead. but the first word of animals, which as a first word belongs to the Lord, no man may dedicate, whether ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. And if it is, a, I'm sorry, where did you want me to get that? 29. 29. And if it is an unclean animal, then he shall buy it back at the valuation and add a fifth to it. Or if it is not redeemed, it shall be sold at the valuation. But no devoted thing that a man devotes to the Lord of anything that he has, whether man or beast, or of his inherited field, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. No one, no one devoted who is to be devoted for the destruction of mankind shall be ransomed. He shall surely be put. Okay, so this is a stipulation, a uh, special stipulation for those things that are devoted. They, they cannot be redeemed uh, or sold. They are basically the priests then obtain them and use them uh, for what they need. Um, but notice also those that are devoted for destruction. Um, Judas shall not be redeemed. I mean, that, that's the way you've got to think of it, you know, uh, uh, because he was devoted for destruction. Um, and again, we know he's not ransomed. Uh, somebody read 30 to the end. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is totally to the Lord. If a man, if a man redeems any of his tithe, he must have a fifth of the value to it. see them as the as the animals are coming out he got his prize one that's going to be number 10 hold on hold on hold on <laughs> okay so so god establishes a routine for their vow offerings um what was the purpose for the vow we saw with the other the burnt offerings it was to feed the um, the priest and his family. What were these offerings given for? Okay. Yeah, yeah. To, to make sure that the, the sanctuary was taken care of. Um, sound familiar? And I think this is, you know, reading through all the legalese, I, again, this to me is the bottom line. So, how does this appear in our worship practice today? What, what would be the equivalent of this chapter at All Saints Lutheran Church? Mm -mm. The offering. Yeah, the offering. Yeah, the offering. Well, you also have, like, all these rich things here, and there's other places like the St. Last Night. There you go. In memory of or dedication of the special right. gifts for the church. <laughs> or, or the when we had the, the pews that were given to the congregation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, again, anything that goes to the upkeep of this place, that's what this is talking about. It is making sure that that, that the place where God dwelt was taken care of. 
And, and again, I, I don't know what they did with the sacrifices. I know that there had been pools of blood all over the place. I know that they had special trenching that would take it out. But as, as somebody mentioned before, still they were splatting blood on the altar. Or imagine being the altar bill in that case. <laughs> <laughs> More than likely, my guess, again, it was the altar. Who would have to take care of that? The priest would have to take care of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, again, these are some things that, you know, we don't see how that is all played out uh, in these things. Right, yeah. So, so yeah, you can see somebody on that hiking up their robe and on their hands and knees <laughs> with a little bon ami. Yeah. Yeah. No, no the, 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 there was a congregation in Lakeland, huge congregation, a non-denominational. Oh, okay, so what was it? It was Baptist. <laughs> that, that, that's always my intrigue when they call themselves non-denominational. But if you sit down and, and start listening to their teaching, you can pretty much figure out where they come from right. um, in, in their in their regard. So this was a non-denominational big one. Um, they had a, they had their own radio station. Uh, they they had a huge sanctuary that they put on Christian music con concerts. Uh, so they they were. Probably the largest church in Lakeland. Um, but in order to become a member there, you had to submit your um, income tax forms. Because your your tithe your tithe was based on your income tax form. And so to become a member there, they said this will be your tithe. And if you didn't pay that tithe, guess what? You didn't become a member there. You weren't treated as a member. I think I read. I in well, what ended up happening is they, the father and the son uh, created a Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. They created a Ponzi scheme, and they started having to sell things off. One of the first things they had to sell off was their uh, radio band, which was a great number for a, a Christian radio station. It was 91.1, <laughs> So uh, that was that was the beginning of the end. In fact, from what I understand, they no longer are a church anymore, and they had, they had this huge facility with all these uh, townhouses and things like that. They, uh, uh, it, it was built for uh, former manual labor workers to retire at. Um, and, and from what my understanding is, it's all broken apart now. Um, it's, it's not under the church's guidance. Uh, in fact, I don't even think the church is there. Uh, operating as a church anymore. Uh, again, you know, when man gets into um, deciding things rather than letting the Lord decide those things, um, that that becomes. But again, you know, that that's why you know that that offering is a something that should be done out of um, devotion and prayer. Uh, that when you give your offering, um, and I and I typically say, you use use your income as a one one piece to that, but don't only make that the one piece. Um, again, how how has the Lord blessed you? Give in return, you know. And, and generally, uh, what I've, I've done in the past is I ask people, figure out, figure out the percentage that you are giving 
if if you have no clue, if you're just giving for the sake of giving, you, you gotta you gotta do more than that. Start with that basis of what is the percentage of what you are giving out, out of your income, and then continue to try to increase it by one percent every year to to keep that idea of pushing yourself. Um, there was a pastor in Britain, and I can't a famous one, and I can't remember his name. Um, he was offered a salary. And every year, the congregation would increase his salary. And he would turn around and give the whole raise back to the church. Because he said, this is what I need to live on. And so, you know, as God blesses me, I'm giving it back to the Lord. So that the Lord, because again, this is what the offering is about. It's for the Lord's work to be done. So, so you know, as, as we are so blessed by the Lord, we ask ourselves, what can I do so that the Lord's work can be done in this place? And so as, as we move forward, hopefully as we reach out more and more, that means, guess what? We will probably need to give more and more um, in, in that response. Um, and, and that, uh, again, that that's what this is all about here in, in Levit Leviticus 27. There was a valuation that would be like our income. You, you see, what is my income? How, what, what do I give from that valuation? Because again, the valuation was based on what work they could do. Um, and then we're not limited to that. We can give above and beyond that. Um, typically, you hear about tithes and offerings. Do you know what the difference between a tithe and an offering is? Huh? How do I define it? A tithe is what we owe God. An offering is what we give above and beyond the tithe. Okay. Yeah. The tithe is that regular giving. It, it's that, you know, until I got older, it was every week. And, and I, I don't, do we have any anybody who gives weekly? Any? A few. There's a few, okay. Because I know, I know some are in the practice of giving weekly. And, and that becomes their pattern of habit. And that's what we used to do, if I remembered to bring the offering envelope with me. Uh, but because of COVID, I've gotten into the practice of, like many of you, is first of the month. Why the first of the month and not the last of the month? Exactly. Exactly. So you want to, again, you want to give up your first fruits um, so that the work of the church can continue to go on. Any other questions or comments there? Apologetics. How would you define apologetics? What? A defense. Okay, for us it's a defense of the faith. What do you mean by a defense? Yeah, so let me understand why I believe the way I believe and what it means to me and has done for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very critical to understand because <clears throat> there, there, are, there are some Christians who uh, a defense is I'm getting into an argument and I'm going to prove that I'm right. That's not an apology. An apology is, um, as I've said before, I don't like the phrase, let's agree to disagree. An apology is, let's have a conversation to see if we can get closer together with one another. You see that? 
Right. Yeah. Apology to the Oxford Confession. Yeah. Well, and, and that because that was the subsequent answer after they wrote the Augsburg Confession, and then when the response came back, now they are responding to the response. Uh, they're, they're carrying on the conversation. Uh, the whole idea behind it, they were placed in the country of the United States. You could you know, make the church put away the community. Well, and I watched the video recently, and they said, and they were just absolutely, I, I don't know where they got their information on Luther, but, you know, he, he, he was saying that Luther was, was causing the, the breakaway from the Catholic Church, and that was far from his... That's not where he was willing to go. He, 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 wanted, he wanted the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church to make the changes, thereby the discussion... Um, and, and that's where you have to have the conversation, uh, it, and not with the idea that, um, that you're going to change, uh, what they are thinking, but you're hoping that you can give a response that will cause them to reflect and, because again, who can, ch who can, can you change anybody's thought? Who can change somebody's thought? Holy Spirit, and and that's why that's why we do apologetics is is we present scriptural background, um, and and if you get in that discussion with other Christians, um, they're going to present scriptural background. Talk to a Baptist about infant baptism. You'll, you'll, find, you'll find the scripture passages they pull out, and then we have our scripture passages that we pull out, and it, it, it's, a, it's a matter of having, right, it's a matter of having the discussion uh, hopefully come together. Um, the thing I, I want you to do is turn to Psalm 89. And too bad Jack's not here, because Jack usually reads the Psalms on, <laughs> on Wednesday. Psalm 89. I'll read it for us, but I will let you know what verses. This, be, this becomes the basis for what I'm presenting to you. Um, I'm going to read this, and then I'm gonna, we're going to read another one, and then I will, I will give you what the topic is of discussion is, but Psalm 89, I'm going to read 28 to 37. And by the way, um, when we turn to the next one, somehow mark Psalm 89 because we're going to come back to it later. Um, so Psalm 89, 28 to 37. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever. And my covenant will stand firm for him. I will, I will establish his, his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the sky. Keep that thought in mind. Then turn to 2 Samuel. Second Samuel 7. Hopefully.
hopefully when I read 2 Samuel 7, you'll hear a parallel with the psalm I just read. 2 Samuel 7, beginning at verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. And then skip down to verse 23. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its gods. Does the Psalm and 2 Samuel sound very familiar, it's similar? Okay, you should hear similarity. Of whom do are they talking about? We, that's our lens. But if you're just looking Old Testament lens, who are they talking about? They're talking about David and they're talking about the line. They're talking about Israel, okay? And this becomes the problem in the discussion today as how do we look at what's going on in Israel? This is where apologetics come in, folks. Because there are some, and they are, they are in our community, there are some Christian churches that believe we need to hold on to the nation of Israel because of what I just read. In fact, and, and I, will, I will give this to you later for those of you that are interested. Uh, how many of you have heard of John Hagee? Very prominent Christian, um, but he has he has some websites and stuff on the support for Israel, the support of the nation of Israel. Okay, um, and, and again, he uses biblical you know uh, passages to support his view on that. Um, First of all, I'm going to read this one. Uh, he's quoting from Genesis 12, verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Point. God has promised to bless the man or nation that blesses the chosen people. History has proven beyond reasonable doubt that the nations that have blessed the Jewish people have had the blessing of God. The nations that have cursed the Jewish people have experienced the curse of God. Where does that, where is that wrong or where does that fall short? How would you respond to a John Hagee in that? He's quoting scripture, Genesis 12, 3, that those who bless the nation shall be blessed and those that curse the nation shall be cursed. And he would say, look at the United States. And he would, and he would say, look at what happened in Germany. Yeah. And I can give you a lot of examples of, that he would probably give. But when our readers are right, we, that we all are the people of Israel. So you say, well, what was the reason for Christ? That's, that's where this, 
and, and, and there's other things here. I'm going to read a few of them. There are other things here. His, his biblical lens, he, he does use uh, new, some New Testament passages, but his biblical lens eliminates Jesus in the picture. And that, become, that becomes the question that you have to ask is, what then of Jesus? What then of, because again, you, you, you jumped ahead <laughs> with, with, with the psalm. With the psalm, a, a person like John Hagee would read that psalm and go, oh, that's talking about David. That's talking about Israel. As, as I Israel is blessed, that, that, that all falls into line. So that that's his that's his lens by which he understands things. But in his lens, he's lost. What's the purpose of Jesus? God has promised to bless the man or nation that blesses the chosen people. Who are the chosen people? If you go to Second Peter, he, it says that we are the chosen people. We are a whole. We are a holy nation. We are. We are it. Well, we are Israel because who is Israel? Jesus Christ is Israel, and because oh, Jack, why aren't you here? <laughs> because it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I then become Israel. I am the holy nation. I am, you know, that uh, chosen people. So his name Haiti is also, I've actually watched him, but I know all about it. But uh, it sounds like he's giving validity to the Jewish faith. Yes. Right. So what do you do in the New Testament when, when oh, it, Jesus said, you know, the, the temple will be destroyed, and on three days I will build, bring it back, build it back up again. And literally, the temple was destroyed, but he was also talking about, his, you know, he was prophesying that, but he was also pro prophesying his death and resurrection uh, in that. So again, yes, what, what do you, what, you, you basically disavow everything about Christ. There might be some Lutherans, but not from the church body itself. No, okay. From the Baptist church body, from the Assembly of God's church right. body, it comes from the church body. No, no. Yeah. I understand the difference. Yeah. And here, here's, here's the second thing. Christians owe a debt of eternal gratitude to the Jewish people for their contributions that gave birth to the Christian faith. Jesus Christ, the prominent rabbi from Nazareth, said, Salvation is of the Jews, St. John 4.22. Consider what the Jewish people have given to Christianity. The sacred scripture, the prophets, the patriarchs, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the twelve disciples, the apostles. What's wrong or what is what falls short in that statement? God gave all that. God gave all of that stuff. <laughs> right. You forgot to include the beatings and the crown of thorns. I, the, the first one hit me. Consider what the Jewish people have given to Christianity, the sacred scripture. Okay. Uh, what? <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. Um, so again, you... you He's looking at, the, at those who put pen to paper, not the, not the one that gave it. Correct. Uh, again, again, who's he eliminating out of his thinking? Well, you can use that term, a prominent rabbi. That to me lessened the name of Jesus. And when you look at the scribes and the Pharisees, did they consider him a rabbi? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they did. 
They considered him a rabbi. That's why they went and questioned him time and time again. But what did they not consider him? Son of God. Right. Forrest, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just thinking, it's almost like this guy's worshiping the created rather than the creator. Because all that he mentions all points to Christ. It's all there. It's all there for the purpose of pointing to God and Christ and what he's doing. So we have to putting credence to, oh, look how wonderful this is. We should honor him. And there's no point that all that was to tell us what God's going to do or what God has done. <laughs> again, this is right. It, it, again, it, it's through that limited lens. Um, it, this is the next one. He said, while some Christians tried to deny the connection between Jesus of Nazareth and the Jews of the world, Jesus never denied his Jewishness. He was born Jewish. He was circumcised on the eighth day in keeping with Jewish tradition. He had his bar mitzvah on his 13th birthday. I don't know where he got that from. Uh, he kept the law of Moses. He wore the prayer shawl Moses commanded all Jewish men to wear. Uh, he died on a cross with an inscription over his head, King of the Jews. Okay. Uh, Jesus considered the Jewish people his family. Jesus said in Matthew 25, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it, Unto one of the least of these, my brethren, the Jewish people, and he puts this in parentheses, the Jewish people, Gentiles, were never called his brethren. Ye have done it to me. Oh, by the way, if you look in, uh, where, turn to Hebrews 3. I think that's the one. Now I know I know he he will refute this and say, well, these weren't these weren't Jesus's words. The problem with that is now now we see what his view of Scripture is. If he doesn't if if he doesn't hold this as being the word of God, then he he can distinguish between the words of Jesus and the other words. Um, that, that would be my, my thinking that that would be his. Because notice he said, Jews were never called his brethren. I mean, Gentiles were never called his brethren. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, uh, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he, they would not enter his rest, but the, to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. What's he going to do with that whole thing? <laughs> but, but who's being called brothers here? But it's the Jews and the Gentiles are being called brothers. Uh and, and he goes on and on with this. Um, I got it. Oh, um, why did Jesus go to the house of Cornelius in Capernaum? Turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 is the story of uh, Jesus going to a Gentile's house to heal the servant who was sick and at the point of death. 
And here is John Hagee's reason for why Jesus went there. It's verse 4. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who, is, who built us our synagogue. That's John Hagee's reference on, on why Jesus went to heal this servant. The problem is, he, he, he didn't go far enough, because go to verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Why did he heal the servant? Because of the faith, not because that he loves the Jews and built the synagogue. Uh, again, th this, is, this is how you have to, you know, examine what they put as scripture and say, okay, I hear where you're coming. I mean, this is a perfect example. Perfect example is, okay, I hear where you're coming from, but read a little further. Um, Right. That was that was that, that was a couple Sundays ago in the gospel. Who's my brother? Who's my son? Mm -hmm. Right. Those that do the will of the Father. It's not about loving. And again, if it was about loving the Jews, what do you do with the great uh, the great commandment? What's the great commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your Oh, love the Jew. <laughs> and now that's not what he said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right, right. So we get back to Psalm 89. Because th that... Psalm 89, those opening verses, yes, he, he would agree steadfastly saying, yes, 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 yes. But he would say this all points to David. And Forrest, I agree with you. Yes, it does point to David, but ultimately its fulfillment is in Christ. But go on, go on it from verse 38. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You have breached all his walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all the enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword, and you have not made him and you have not made him stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth. You have covered him with shame. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? And then down verse 39. Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? What's the answer to that question? What's the answer to the question in 49? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? It's still there, but when you swore to David, he had punished him for his deeds. Right, but, but where is his steadfast love? In Jesus, in Christ. Yes. You know, and, and, that's, and, and again, that's, that's what I would bring up, because he would say, oh, yeah, 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 you're, you're making, John Hagee would say, you're making my argument for me in those, it, what were the first verses, 28 to 37. But then I'd say, well, read 38 and following that's exactly what the Jews did in, in the Gospels. And the answer to the question in 49 is, where is your steadfast love of old by which your faithfulness you swore to David? It's in Christ. Um, so this is why we do not hold to that theology that we need, because again, the nation of Israel that we know of is not the Old Testament Israel.
The nation of Israel is an entity that was formed, what, 47, 46? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a political entity that was formed in 1947. That is not the scriptural Israel that we know of. Scriptural Israel now is defined in Christ. Um, so when you hear that, let your ears perk up. Uh, because again, what they are doing is exactly what Bob said earlier is, where is Christ in the equation? Where is Christ in the equation? Let's close with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for what you have given to us in your word. And let us take the fullness of the word, not just bits and pieces. Uh, but uh, again, uh, in that word, it's framed all in Christ. Uh, and, and what we see in Christ then uh, unfolds and defines for us how we live our life in you. So continue to enable us to, to hear with ears, to see with eyes, and to believe with our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If anybody want a copy of this, you're more than welcome. Because I've got copies here. And I've got other biblical references to refute the argument.